Well, I'm glad you're here. Let's get into it this morning. We are, if you're brand new, you're joining us for the first time or maybe the first time in a while, we're ending a series that we started a few weeks ago called Margin, okay? And we're focusing on making room for what really matters, okay? Making room for what really matters. But as we end this today, I want to tell you what's coming up next week because next week we're starting one of the most exciting seasons of the year around here at JC Naz, and that's Christmas season. If you've not experienced a Christmas with us, if you're coming at some point throughout the summer or whatever, uh, boy, you're going to want to be here for this. And we've got some incredible things planned. But one of those is a series called Fear Not, How Christmas Sets Us Free from Fear. And so we're going to be looking to those biblical stories, those traditional stories that we see in Scripture surrounding Christmas. And, and God's going to speak to us, all right? And we've got some great celebrations planned, and you'll hear more about that. Let me just encourage you, as I always do, to be inviters. Those cards, the Connect cards, will be here for that series next week. But just be bringing people, getting the word out. There's so many people who haven't yet heard about Jesus. They haven't yet made a commitment to him. They haven't yet connected to a church family like this. You know, in our culture, we have people coming in all the time that are new, looking for these kinds of vital connections. So if you found joy and, and you found uh, hope and encouragement here, boy, spread that. Just, just start, even if you're a very first Sunday, and you say, boy, we love it here already. Uh, boy, be inviting your friends and neighbors and coworkers as well. So we're going to get into it, and we're, we're looking into God's Word this morning as we finish up this series. And we're going to be looking at how we can find some encouragement and practical help to help us build in and maintain these margins we've been talking about in our lives, okay? And I, I just want to praise God as we finish up this series. You can go back, and we've, been, we've laid a lot of foundation up to this point, but even if you're here for the first time, this message will encourage you, okay? We've been talking about what margins are, why they're so vital in our lives. And I just have to praise God for how he's been using this series so powerfully in the life of our church. Rarely has a day gone by these last really three weeks, no exaggeration, rarely has a day gone by where I've not had a conversation or a phone call or an email or a text or something from someone, a post on social media that I've seen of somebody who, who has said in one way or another, you know, this series has really impacted our lives, the Lord is helping us in this season, people have said to me in one way or another, to help us focus on what's most important. Other families have said in different ways, we are, we are really reshifting our priorities. We're really reordering our priorities. Things have got a little out of line for a while, but now we're coming back and we're making some difficult but much needed choices. Uh, other people have said, you know what, we're going to live countercultural. We said last week, right, that margin, living with margins is so countercultural. You can't even imagine, but it's, it's the calling of God upon our lives as people who follow him and trust him and pattern our lives after his word. And a lot of families have said, we're going to live countercultural. We, in other words, we are going to start, we just refuse to live our lives chronically rushed, chronically late, chronically exhausted. Because you know something, you know this, right, if you look around. That's how a lot of people in our world, maybe even a lot of people you know, are living their lives, Right? But what this last three weeks has been all about is that, is that I've been trying to remind us and Holy Spirit's been reminding us that as a child of the living God, if you've come to know him through Jesus, if you put your faith in the Lord, you're a child of God. And, and as someone who's filled with his spirit, listen, we don't have to live that way. We don't have to live like the rest of our world, all maxed out and frazzled and fried to a crisp because of the pace of our lives. And so listen, if you continue to seek him and you'll listen to him and you'll dig into his word, and find out what pleases him. Listen, he's going to be faithful from here on out, even through this crazy Thanksgiving, holiday, Christmas, New Year season we're in. He's going to be faithful to help you build and maintain those healthy, life-giving, relationship-strengthening, God-honoring margins, okay? So we're, um, one of my favorite testimonies, let me share this with you before we get to the Word of God. One of my favorite testimonies of this entire series came from a family. They put this on Facebook. And so this is what they said. This was the week one, I believe. They said, an amazing weekend, leaving the margin wide open. I love that. They said, first of all, an amazing church service. Then the kids learned how to change a tire, shot some skeet, watched and waved at several trains, rode four-wheelers, enjoyed supper with grandma and grandpa, played go fish, and sat in front of the fire eating ice cream. Amen. Hallelujah. Right? I mean, you know you're doing something right in your life. You know you got margins if you have time to sit in front of the fireplace and eat ice cream, right? And so that's, that's wonderful, right? That's, that's, that's just not something that, you know, um, one family can do. We can build those life-giving margins. All of us can do that. All of us can experience room in our life to breathe and attend to those things that matter the most. But guess what? Christmas is upon us, folks. 
Much as I hate to admit that before Thanksgiving, it is. It is on us. And the culture, if you've noticed it, it's already gone in this like hyper overdrive. And I'm telling you, it's coming. Even before you've had to remove time to remove the Thanksgiving leftovers from the table, it's coming. This dark and terrible plague known as Black Friday <laughs> will be upon us. It will grip our lives. And it just seems like from that point on, man, it's just, it's all... Really, until New Year, our culture is caught up in this Christmas frenzy. People are going 90 miles an hour all the time, killing themselves to save a few dollars on bed sheets and making sure everything from the family pictures to the parties to the, to the presents, make sure it's all picture perfect, Pinterest perfect, right? And so I, because of that, I know us in a room this size and filled with people and and. and Everybody who's watching online right now, we haven't done that. Can we stop church family that are gathered in this room? Let's welcome everybody who's gathered online right now, watching from all over. Really do love you guys. We count you as a part of our family every week you tune in. And so I bet with all everybody listening right now, there's someone already, it's early, but already you started to feel maybe a lot like Job. I love this. In Job 3, 26, it says, I have no peace. I have no quiet. I have no rest. And trouble keeps coming. Anybody want to stand and testify? I mean, right? That's, that's our, sometimes our lives, right? That's the way we live. But can I just encourage you this morning and remind you again that God wants so much. He desires so deeply to relieve all the unnecessary tension and strain from your soul. He wants to help you with that. How, how many of you have ever seen a NASCAR race? Seen it on TV, maybe you've even been to one, all right? Some of you are NASCAR fans, right? I mean, these high-performance race cars are truly Remarkable machines. They're amazing. Well, you, got, you obviously know, right, to keep them running properly, to make sure they're running effectively and competitively. It doesn't just happen by itself. They have to schedule in as they're running these races. Okay, they take hours and hours and hours. They have to consistently schedule in these pit stops to attend to important things like, like fuel, refueling and tire changes and repairs, right? Now, all these adjustments that are so crucial to keep the car performing as it should, all right? And listen to me, if you, if you and I are going to live a high-performance, fruitful, effective, God-honoring life that impacts this world for Jesus, listen, we're, we're, if we're going to do what God designed us to do, we have to schedule in regular pit stops into our lives. We're calling them margins, okay? Margins, extra space, more time than you need, more resources than you need so you can refuel you can refresh and reset your life for the next 50 laps or whatever. Listen carefully to what I'm going to say to you. You can't fix anything going 200 miles an hour. Sometimes we act like we can. Man, we're on the go and God's trying to get our attention and we're just running from here to there. And listen, these NASCAR guys know, these drivers know that if they ignore the signs of their car, the warning signs of their car, if they ignore the way the car is performing and it's not performing correctly, the tires are not gripping the, the turns right, they're slipping and sliding. Listen, they, they, could not only, they could not only lose the race, but there's a good chance they may not finish the race. But what everyone seems to know intuitively in NASCAR and accepts, we, we tend very often to forget and seem to neglect that in our everyday lives. But do you know that you have warning signs too? Just like a car, we talked about the check engine light comes on in our car. Something needs attending to. we got to stop. we got to make time to get that in there and address that. Well, you have warning lights, too, in, in, in our lives. We all do. We have lots of warning lights, actually. But again, because how overloaded many of us are and because of all the noise and distractions in our lives we, that we're immersed in every day, we often don't recognize them. If we do notice them, we kind of push them away. But here's some of the warning lights that you and I have. Pain is a warning light. Physical pain, physical symptoms, that's a warning light. Stress is a warning light. Fatigue is a warning light. Just this constant feeling of being drained. Listen, irritability is a major warning light that shows us all the time that we are way, way, way past our limits. You know, have you ever been there? You know if you're there. I mean, a kid comes in, can we have some mac and cheese? No! You know, just, ah! It's just like some little simple, simple request just pushes us over the edge. You know, man, I am living a marginless life, right? Here's another one. Apathy. 
apathy, just this sometimes you're maxed out, you're frazzled, fried to a crisp because of the pace of life, and you just disconnect, man, emotionally, maybe even physically. You're just like, forget it. I don't even care if that happens. I don't care if they, you know, we apathetic, apathy grips our lives. Loss of enthusiasm, loss of joy. Listen, all these are indicators that we need to get serious and intentional about making the choice of building these margins into our lives. Okay, so even though we're wrapping this up today, here's what I'm going to challenge you with. After this is over and we've gone on to the next series and we're into the Christmas season, this may be more important than ever. But especially between now, it's not too early. In fact, it's, 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 it's a great time because you still have time to make a choice. If you don't make the choice today, it's likely that you're going to get swept up into the frenzy of our culture. And you're going to be standing at the door of 2020 going, what happened, man? Where did it go? And that wasn't fun at all. And oh, thank God. Thank the Lord Christmas is over. You know, that, sadly, that's sometimes the attitude we have. But I want to challenge you between now and for sure the new year to just go before the Lord. And I'm challenging you to make it a habit to go before him and pray this simple prayer. I'm convinced our Father is drawn to the simplicity of our prayers. Not to be wordy to him, but this, just pray this simple prayer every day. Lord, please show me. Show me today how to build my life around what matters most. If you'll pray that and you'll mean it and you'll sincerely wait on him for the answer, I'm telling you, he will respond in such a powerful way. He'll show you how to keep these margins in your life through the changing seasons. So we're going to turn our attention to the Word of God this morning. So I hope you have a Bible or you have a device you can pull uh, some Scripture up with. The words are going to be on the screen, but I always encourage you to have the Word of God in front of you, okay, so you can read it for yourself. And maybe God will draw your attention to other things in the midst of that. But it's really interesting as we look into this passage today, um, of all the people that Jesus interacted with, of all the people that his life intersected as the Son of God living on this earth, and during his three and a half years or so of public ministry, there's really only one, it seems, that we know of, that we have recorded anyway. There's one that he seems to kind of, you know, focus in on and hone in on and say, hey, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're, You're way too overwhelmed, you're overstretched, you're overloaded, you're overscheduled, okay? And this story is found in Luke chapter 10. Can anybody guess who this might be? It's it's a woman. Her name is Martha. Martha. And she, of course, has a sister named Mary. They also have a brother named Lazarus. This is the same Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead. Amazing story. Later on in the Gospel of John, we see that. But, But this family is really close personal friends with Jesus. Hey, they supported his ministry. They provided a necessary, um, you know, retreat from all the demands of ministry. He would often stop at their house and have a meal and share some time. He loved this family. They loved him. As we're going to see, this story takes place in a little village outside of Jerusalem known as Bethany. In fact, the town is still there today. This town that we're reading about, you could go visit it if you were over there. And, And Jesus and his disciples, again, would often make a pit stop at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. As they're traveling around the country, as they're traveling around the villages and the cities, telling people about the, the, the coming redemption of God, how God will, has sent a Messiah, and it's, and it's Jesus, and he's going to save the people from their sins. As he's doing that important work, he um, stops at this house. And this is how Luke, Luke chapter 10, this is how the scene is described. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village, that's Bethany, where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he had to say. But Martha, verse 40, but Martha was distracted. I want you to stop right there because there are two crucial phrases in this story that you cannot miss. Okay, the Lord's going to speak a message in your heart that's going to change things for you this week and on into Christmas and New Year, you have to get this. Two crucial phrases. This is one of them right here. You cannot miss this. Martha was distracted. Okay, you got it? Remember that. Martha was what? She was distracted. Why was she so distracted? Well, here it is. By all the preparations that had to be made. So she came to him, that's Jesus, and she asked, Lord, don't you care? (laughs) Don't you care? (laughs) That my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. I, I always laugh when I read this passage. It's so comical because not only is she distracted, but she, don't you think she's a bit bossy too? 
I mean, it's amazing. She is literally trying to tell the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity, the one that created her and everything in the world, the Bible tells us. She's telling him what to do. I'm glad we never do that. I had a friend I was with this last weekend. I was up in Olathe with a group of pastors, and he said, I don't tell God what to do, but I sure advise him from time to time, right? Yeah, well, yeah, whatever you want to call it. But that, she's, she's pretty bold here talking to Jesus this way. Don't you care? Don't you care, Jesus? And I'm over here all stressed out. And, and listen, remember who she's talking to. She's talking to the Son of God, the one who willingly, voluntarily, in, and out of obedience to the Father, he left the glory and the splendor and the perfection of heaven to come to this earth that, would, that he created and come to the people that would, uh, many of them would reject him and he's the, literally the one who's going to give his life on the cross. He's, he's the one that said, I've come to serve and not to be served. And he's going to and, and give my life as a ransom for many. And he's going to do that. Here in a short time, he's going to give his life on the cross. He's going to spill his blood to save everybody who turns to him. Because we cannot save ourselves. And, and yet amazingly, Martha says, don't you care? Don't you care that I'm just over here stressed out, God, working myself to death, getting dinner ready for all of you? Don't you care? Well, actually, Jesus does care, amen? Jesus cares very, very much, and that's why in his response to Martha, he, listen, he's about to teach her one of the most important lessons she's ever learned in her life. And I'm convinced the spirit of the living God is here, and he's been preparing our hearts through the wonderful worship and the fellowship and, and, and all the donuts and the coffee. He's been using all of it to get us ready to hear this message as well, okay? And he has a message for us. I, I believe the reason that this scripture is in our Bible Listen, what we're all about here is we're about putting ourselves in a position where God can help us be Christ-like disciples or followers of Christ who transform their world. And he's trying to teach us how we're called to live, the pattern that we need to order our lives by, the priority that we need to implant in our lives so we can transform the world. And the reason God is holding this truth up before you this morning is so that you and I can make a courageous choice, a courageous choice just like Mary. Let me... Let me Find the rest of this passage for you, Luke chapter 10. The first phrase in there, Luke chapter 10, the first phrase in there was uh, Martha was distracted. Here's the second one right here. He responds to her, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen. There's the second phrase, okay? Martha was distracted, but Mary made a choice. Okay, Mary made a choice, and she chose what is better, and Jesus said, Martha, Martha, I love you. And notice he says her name twice, so just, you just know, maybe you don't know, but if you understood that culture, when you said someone's name twice, that's a very endearing, a very loving, kind of gentle response. He wasn't scolding her. He wasn't beating her over the head and saying, why, why can't you figure this out, Martha? He's saying, Martha, Martha. Come on, you can be in here too. You can make this choice too. You can choose to prioritize your life around what really matters. And Jesus is wanting to teach all of us how to do that. Listen, Mary, in the midst of all the demands and all the busyness, in the midst of all the expectations that were pressing in upon her and maybe crushing her, in the midst of all the countless other good things that she could have been doing in that moment and even needed to be done in that moment, listen, Mary, clearly, Mary chose what was best. I always like to point this out when, when I teach from these passages because I think sometimes we read the Bible and we think, oh, that was easy for them. You know, I mean, it was easy for her to go in and sit in the living room, sit at Jesus' feet and take time to be with him and attend to what really matters. Because after all, the Bible people, they didn't have anything going on, right? They didn't have lives. I mean, they just sat around and worshiped and prayed. No, listen, no way. They were human beings, their moms and dads and grandparents, and they had jobs, and, and they worked the fields and the crops and tended the livestock, and, 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 and some of them maybe were soldiers, and, you know, so they had lives, and they were busy people, just like we are sometimes, and I just think we get it wrong if we, if we think this was easy for her. We don't know a lot about her personality. We don't know a lot about her life from the Scripture, but she's a real person, right? And, and I bet she had a lot going on that day. Don't you think it was very possible that Mary found it very hard to say no to her sister. Some of us are going to experience that. Some of us are sweating the holidays because we find it incredibly difficult to say no to family. Don't you think maybe, maybe Mary was like that? Maybe Mary, maybe Mary felt this internal pressure, of, uh, this fear of, I don't want to let anybody down. 
You know, we feel that sometimes. Maybe, maybe it was hard for her to say no. Maybe, I wonder if at, all, if at all possible, what Mary was concerned with most that day is what others thought of her. You know, here I am sitting. I'm a woman. I'm not even supposed to be in here with the men in that culture. That was a taboo. And yet there she was sitting with the men, listening to Jesus like, like one of his disciples, right? And I wonder if she th- cared at all about what other people thought about her. Maybe she really struggled. Who knows? But she may have really struggled to keep margin in her life. And yet, and yet, listen, she made a choice. Whatever struggle she was having internally, whatever pressure was put on her externally, she made a courageous choice. And I'm telling you this morning, it's a choice that makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. And I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of hope. It gives me a lot of hope. I don't think it was easy for her. And I don't think it's easy for us in our culture to make this choice. But it gives me a lot of hope because I I start to realize that in the midst of all the pressures that I'm facing and the demands and the expectations and the responsibilities that I and you face every day, that you and I can make the same choice. You and I can choose what is best. I I can choose. You can choose. Your marriage, your, your family can choose to build your life around what matters most. You understand this? All the demands and the distractions and the busyness, and the noise, and the clutter, and the the hurry of life, all that we experience every single day, do you you realize that's never just going to take care of itself? I'm not not trying to insult your intelligence, but have you come to that realization that is so important to realize that's not just going to auto-correct automatically, right? I guess that's kind of redundant, right? It's not going to auto-correct, let me just say it simply, right? But listening to some people, you would think they actually believe that it will take care of itself. Because here's the way a lot of people talk. I've said this myself. Hey, someday, hey, someday things are going to slow down. Hey, sometime, some way, somewhere down the road, I, I'm not sure exactly where, but sometime we're going to have time to attend to what really matters. And man, people that talk like that, their life zips by. It's not going to happen. It's not going to take care of itself. Listen, 2020 that we are speeding towards, it's not going to be any different at all from 2019 unless, like Mary, we realize we have opportunity to make a choice. We have a choice to make. And Jesus says, you know, when you really get right down to it, if you just strip everything else away and you get down to the base of it, the foundation, there's really only one thing that's needed. But do you understand this? The Lord will never force you to make this choice. He's not going to force you to come in out of the craziness of the kitchen. He'll just wait. He'll, he'll invite you. He'll call out to you. He'll draw, draw you in and, and, cause, and help you to choose to make time to be with him and to focus on what really matters. So, so let's just slow down for a minute here and let me just make sure we understand the details of the story because I think it's really fascinating what's going on here. And if we don't really kind of just name it and focus on it, we'll hurry by it, we'll miss it. But if you do the math in your head of how many people are there, I think it helps you understand why Mary reacted and why she responded to Jesus the way she did, why she's so uptight. She's so, she, she get this sense that she's at the breaking point, you know? So you have Jesus, right, and you have his 12 disciples, that's 13, and then at the very minimum, you have Mary, Martha, and oh yeah, don't forget they have a brother who lives there as well, his name's Lazarus, and so, and then also beyond that, in this culture, I guarantee it, although it's not recorded, I guarantee, giving the popularity of Jesus, giving the crowds he was drawing in other areas, I guarantee there was other people there. Jesus doesn't just walk into town without people noticing and so in that day, the, the houses, you, you know, it's, I don't have time to go into it, but they weren't, they weren't all locked up and private like our houses now. When you have a meal with someone, no one's going to know, really. They may see a car, but they're not going to come up. But in that day, it was all kind of open, and people would just kind of come up in the middle of the dinner, and they would just stand and listen. So there might have been other people that were invited. We don't know that. So for the sake of argument, we do know for sure, though, how many? Sixteen. Sixteen people for dinner. That's a lot to get ready for. That's pretty heavy. Just just personalize that. Just imagine you got 16 people coming over for dinner this afternoon. You'd be a mess, wouldn't you? You wouldn't be be listening to anything I'm saying right now because you'd be making a list going, oh, my goodness, we haven't done laundry still piled in the hallway, and we got beds, and we got to shove it all in the closet, and how are we going to figure, you know, we're already making responsibility lists for everybody. We'd be a mess. 
I know we would if we had 16 people coming over for dinner after church today. And so I think the reason she says what she says to Jesus is because peeking around the corner constantly and giving the old eye roll, it's not working. And making all the extra noise with the pots and pans in the kitchen to get Mary's attention and all the sarcastic hints she's dropping, you know, they're not working. Like, she's in there stirring you. How you doing in there, Mary? Are you enjoying yourself, Mary? Yeah, you look real relaxing. You just sit there and, you know, it's not working. And she goes right to Jesus. And when she jumps on Jesus, Jesus responds back very graciously. And he says, Martha, Martha, you're so worried. So worried about so many things, but really only one thing is important, okay? And Mary has chosen it, okay? So here's the question, okay? Because we ultimately, I mean, it's a great story, but we don't, we don't really care about Mary and Martha, right? We don't care about Lazarus. We don't, we, we, it's our lives now. It's what, we, what are we going to do Monday? What are we going to do this week? And so here's the question I want to put before you. When you think about your life, when you think about the busyness of your day and, you know, you jump up out of bed and you, you get ready, you rush around the house in the morning to get ready and you fly through your day and, and, and it seems like today we, we all have to work extra, extra hard to get anything accomplished just to stay afloat because we're working one-handed because the other hand's working this stupid thing all day and, and we're just distracted and we're constantly on the go and we're on the run and we rush and we hurry and we stress and we gripe and we complain and we sweat and we panic and we worry and we fall into bed that night, totally empty, totally exhausted. I mean, we are wiped out, and we pray, dear God, give me the strength to do it all again tomorrow. And we bite our lip, and we put our head down, and we go again the next day. And you know, there's a lot of regret. We talked about this in week one. There's a lot of important things that get pushed out of our lives when we live marginless. And there's a lot of regret that comes with that, because I would bet if you're honest, We lay in bed at night sometimes or in the quieter moments of our day, we think, man, that that neighbor, I've been wanting to, that neighbor that doesn't know Jesus and I don't know, doesn't have a church, I've been wanting to connect with him. We've been wanting to have them over for months for dinner and man, but time just flies on by us. Or that family at church, man, we we had such great friendship, but it seems like lately we got disconnected a little bit and we, we got so busy, we had to drop our small group, and we don't see them anymore. We've been wanting, and every time we see them, we say, hey, we ought to do dinner sometime. Yeah, let's, let's call us. We'll go out to dinner. So we'll go out to eat. We'll get together. But, but, you know, there's a lot of regret there because we realize that hasn't happened. Sometimes there's a lot of regret because we get up in the morning, and we fly through our day, and we fall into bed exhausted, and we think, man, I didn't one time crack this book. I didn't, I didn't stop for even a minute and give thanks to God and there wasn't any time to be still before him and sit at his feet. And so we, we kind of carry that throughout the day. And that, that accumulates and that builds up and it has an impact on us. Okay? And so here's the question. Are you intentionally willing to make a choice to push back on that? Because I'm telling you, the world applauds that lifestyle. It's kind of it's fun to live that way because everybody kind of says, you're, man, look at you. You're a go-getter. Wow, you're ambitious. Wow. You're, and we say yes to too many things, and, and we don't want to just, you know what I'm saying? The world kind of applauds that, which kind of fuels this whole thing. But what I'm asking you this morning is, would you be courageous enough to push back on the busyness of life? Again, and I'm warning you, like I do every year at this time, the busyness and the hurry and the noise and the pressure, it's, it's coming on us like a tsunami. It's coming right now. It's going to be upon us before we know it. And what I'm asking, are you willing to make real choices? So in the midst of all that, you know, we can't leave the world. We don't want to do that. We're called here to be a light, right? But in the midst of all that, are you willing to make a choice to make real room for Christ? So that everything you do, do. All the activity you are involved in, that can have real meaning. And that can have lasting impact on others in the name of Jesus. Let me make something else clear about this story. I think this is real important. It's going to set some of you at ease. You understand, Martha wasn't doing anything bad or immoral. And that's why I wanted to make it clear that Jesus wasn't scolding her. He's just trying to say, Martha, what you're doing is good, but there's something better. Mary made a choice. There's something better. Martha wasn't doing anything evil or sinful or immoral, okay? Listen, she was serving Jesus for heaven's sake. What better, what's better than serving Jesus? And I don't know, some of you lean a lot towards Martha, right? If we did a poll right now, there'd be a lot of people say, well, I, 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 and I'm, I lean towards Martha. Man, I'm type A, I'm go-getter, I'm high energy. I have two speeds. I'm like, go, 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 and, and out. 
That's, that's my speech. You ask my wife, if I get horizontal, I'm done. So I can't lay down until I'm ready to go to sleep because when I do, I'm out, okay? And, and I just don't wake up until it's time to go again, right? So I'm, I mean, I, I have high energy. God's kind of wired me that way. So I definitely relate more to Martha. So for those of us who do that, this is a little bit of a struggle, right? Because we feel like, oh, you shouldn't be a Martha. And I got to tell you, I've taught this passage so wrong for so many years in the past. And as a young pastor, man, I just kind of kind of grabbed the surface level thing of this. And, and, and basically, I was giving people a choice. Hey, are you a Martha or are you a Mary? And I kind of you know, said, if you're a Martha, that's bad. And if you're a Mary, that's good. And what you need to be is you need to be, you, you need to be a a Mary in a Martha world. That was kind of my message. Pretty. <laughs> I wish I could go back and apologize to people that I shared that with because <laughs> that's, not, that's not it. I don't think that's the story at all, okay? It may feel good. It may have a ring of truth to it. But listen, we, l- l- what I'm trying to say to you is there's a lot of work in the kingdom of God. It requires sometimes a lot of work and a lot of effort in the ministry of the church to have the kind of impact that this church is having. You know, we, they're not lit up yet. We, people are getting saved faster than we can buy light bulbs. That's awesome, right? No, I'm just, yeah, amen. But now we've hit a historic moment in the life of our church in the last, not even two years. We've seen 200 people. There's 100 light bulbs. Each light bulb represents somebody who's publicly given their life to Christ, amen, through the ministries of our church. 200 people, amen, in the last, in the last couple, a year and 10 months. And we've got a third light bulb. And again, it's not about the lights. It's not about the bulbs and the boards and all. That's not it. But each bulb represents a life who's been changed, Amen. And they're following Christ, and they're leading others to Christ, even. So I'm just saying, that doesn't happen automatically. You can't imagine the effort our nursery staff has put in, and our children's department, and, and all the outreaches, and the dinners, and the, the worship team, the hours they put into practicing to create an atmosphere so that people can come in. Some of you, even recently, even last week, just four people gave their lives to Christ. That's because a lot of people worked really hard. And of course, it's all God. We're not patting ourselves on the back. But what I'm trying to tell you is there's a lot of work in the kingdom of God, and someone has to do the work, right? So last Wednesday, we had this incredible, crazy, awesome Thanksgiving dinner. It's one of our favorite meals of the entire year, and the place was packed, and a lot of new people have come, and we were having great fellowship and conversations, but listen, man, the hours that people put into getting ready for that, I can't even describe to you how many different people setting up tables, peeling potatoes, turkeys, and then afterwards, after you all went home and you were almost in bed, there was people still here hours after cleaning up and getting everything ready for the weekend, and there's a lot of work, right? And we're having a big Christmas Day meal. There's a sign-up list out there right now for all the stuff to bring, and there'll be Tons of people here and hundreds and hundreds of people being ministered to, some homeless maybe of our community and maybe veterans that don't have any place to go or soldiers or single. Well, it is, you just name it. There will be a lot of people here, and there will be a lot of people here serving and delivering meals even. It, it takes a lot of work. Well, can you imagine if all those people just came into the sanctuary that were supposed to work that meal and just sat here and prayed all day and sat and worshipped? And what are you doing? Well, we're worshipping. We're sitting at the feet of Jesus. No, no, that's not it, right? And so, listen, this, what I'm trying to say to you is this passage is not about should I serve or should I sit? And the reason we struggle with this is because if we make it between those two things, we'll get it wrong every time. Because, like, well, if I serve all the time, I'm going to burn myself out, right? I'm going to live a marginalized life. But if I sit all the time, well, that's, that doesn't seem to be the way the Word of God instructs us because we see Jesus doing a lot of work. We see Paul saying things like, I pour myself out like a drink offering for the kingdom of God, right? So what is it? It's not between those two things. It's, it's don't ever confuse, listen, being busy, here's what I want to say to you, being busy for Jesus does not equate to being with Jesus. Those two are not the same. You can never get those two confused. We, got, you can, we can never substitute being busy for Jesus for being with Jesus, okay? And see, I just believe so strongly that everything we do, and it's so important, all the roles that you all fill here in the life of this church that help us advance the mission, all those things, they have to flow out of our time with Jesus, Everything we do for him must flow out of our time spent with him. And when we get distracted and we get busy and we squeeze out the margins and we forget that, listen, that's when our service leads to frustration. That's when we get stressed and we get irritable, sometimes with one another, right? We get irritable and we resent our service and we lose our joy that should characterize everything we do for the Lord. 
And we ought to be the most joyful people on the planet in doing what we do because we're doing it for the king of kings, amen? And we're doing it to change lives for all eternity, amen? Amen. And, but when we get it wrong, we, we miss that and we lose that, okay? But listen, when we choose to build our lives around what matters most and we make those crucial decisions, those choices like Mary did, to sit at his feet and listen to him throughout the day, every day, in fact, moments of time where we prioritize that, and then we go out and serve in Jesus' name, Wow, the impact then that we have on others is incredible. It's unbelievable and it's lasting. Listen, here's what it all comes down to. I promise you, I promise you, church, and those of you listening wherever, on a, if you're watching on a cell phone or a laptop right now, when you get to the end of your life, the doctors have your loved ones gathered around and you're laying there at the end of your, I mean, you're just moments away from leaving this world and stepping into eternity. And the doctors or whoever has your family gathered around and they say, you know, it won't be long now. You might want to say your final goodbyes. I promise you in that moment, you will not say, I sure wish I hadn't spent so much time sitting at Jesus' feet. You know, I really wish I hadn't wasted all that time worshiping and praying and seeking the kingdom of God. That's just a lot of time wasted that I will never get back. I promise you, you won't say that. But I just picture myself standing there in eternity before the Lord, which the Bible says we'll all stand there. We'll all stand and we'll all give an account of our lives before the Lord. Nobody, nobody will miss that appointment. Nobody will be late for it. And I cannot imagine standing there looking fully into the wonderful face of Jesus and having Jesus say to me, Mark, what happened down there? There was so much I wanted to say to you. There were so many things I wanted to show you. There was so many blessings I wanted to pour in your lives, but you were were doing a lot of good things. But you missed the best thing. And I can't imagine responding back to Jesus, I'm sorry, Jesus, but I was busy. I was so busy. I can't imagine saying that to him in that moment. Because if I'm being honest, if I'm being judgment day honest, what I'm really saying to him when I'm saying to God I'm too busy is what I'm really saying is, Jesus, you're really just not as important as all those other things. And I know we would never say that, and we don't intend to live that way, but sometimes we, we say that by the pace of our life and our marginless living. So, listen, Christ and Christ alone, Christ and Christ alone is the only one who makes getting up every day and living in this crazy, fast-paced, overloaded, noisy world of ours worth it. He's the only reason. I mean, that's why I get out of bed in the morning. That's why I show up here every day and work hard because he makes it worth it. If it wasn't for him, listen, Jesus is our life, right? He's all we got. And Jesus isn't just someone we add to our already overcrowded, marginless lives. It's not just one more thing we add in that maybe breaks the back of the camel, right? But listen, Jesus is our life. And Jesus and our quality of our relationship with him in this brief mist of a life, it's the only thing that's going to endure for all eternity. So here's what I want to impress upon you this morning. Since it will matter so much then... I'm telling you, 100 years from now, that's the only thing that you're going to be concerned about is my connection with the Lord and the quality of my my closeness with Him. And I just want to impress upon you this morning as we're closing this out, if it'll matter so much then, then doesn't it seem right that it should matter most to us now? I mean, if it's going to matter in eternity, shouldn't it matter right now? Shouldn't it change the way I order and build my life? And so I just want to say to you this morning, the simplest way I know how, Jesus is our life. And if that's true, and if you really believe that, then doesn't it really make sense, right? And we got to have his help. I understand that. But doesn't it make sense that our lives ought to reflect that? And how we choose even to go through this season of Thanksgiving and Christmas and all the activities are going to be just kind of coming at us in light speed. Our lives ought to reflect that, Jesus, you're my life. You're, You're the most important thing. Now and for all eternity. So, so Mary made a choice. And here's where we come to this morning. Are you at a place this morning? Are you ready? Are you ready to make a choice? Are you, so here, here's the simple challenge. What is one thing? I just, like, I just believe in keeping it simple. Not, not five things, not ten things, not twenty things. 
What is one thing you need to do to build your life around what matters most? To be effective for living for Him in this world. To do what He's created you to do, in fact. What is one thing? And when you get that done, when you accomplish that with His grace and His help, you go before Him again. You say, Lord, what is one thing? And you just keep working on that, allowing Him to shape and direct you for His glory. Amen? Amen. What choice do you need to make? Would you stand to your feet this morning? I want to pray, and I want to give God thanks for you and for our church and what He's doing. All the wonderful things he has planned for us this Christmas season. Don't forget, next Sunday, we're kicking off an incredible Christmas celebration here at J.C. Naz. You're not going to want to miss a week, all right? Bring your friends. Let's pray together. Father, we love you with all of our hearts. We just are amazed, and we're so grateful that every week you are the God who speaks to us. It's amazing how a word written thousands of years ago can impact our lives and be so relevant to us today. But, God, we know this is truth. We know it's not enough just to come in and hear a word like this. We've got to be doers of the word. So, Lord, help us. You're so faithful to guide us and show us. In fact, this very morning, your invitation is to come to me. You're, you see everybody's heart. You know every detail of everybody's life. You know what they're going through, God. And your invitation to them is come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. I'll give you rest for your soul. You're extending that gracious invitation to every one of us right now. Help us to have the courage to reach out and receive it and to respond to it, God. You're inviting us. Come to me. Watch me. Learn from me. I'll show you how to do it. And so thank you for that. Thank you for being so faithful, not just telling us what to do, but giving us power to actually live this word out in the midst of a world that so different and tries to pull us in so many different directions. Lord, we give you all the praise today in Jesus' name. Now, if you'll just keep your head bowed for one more prayer for one more minute. You know, it's good to help each other with reducing stress and increasing peace and, you know, working on priorities. That's so important, but what we're really all about here is helping us to address our biggest problem, which is our sin problem. Now, don't get defensive and don't get angry. We're all, the Bible says we've all sinned. And we've all fallen the short of the glory of God. And the Bible also tells us that that sin separates us from the living God who gave His Son so we might have life and we might be forgiven and spend eternity with Him. But the good news is that you don't have to worry about fixing your sin because, in fact, you cannot fix it. Jesus Christ came to die on the cross. He gave His life. He shed His blood to fully forgive you of every sin and to cleanse you and to make you new on the inside and to help you start again. Isn't that just, some of you, your heart is receiving that right now. You're just saying, man, that, that is amazing. That's what I've needed. That's what I've longed for. That's what I've been searching for, a chance to begin again. But I didn't know quite how. God's inviting you into a relationship with him, a new relationship with him that free you from your sin and the pain of the past and help you live the life he's called you to live. I got this from a brother in our church, a dear older gentleman that's really a great mentor to me. He says, I was thinking, Pastor Mark, about what really matters, and God took me to a passage that I put into my memory some time ago, Jeremiah chapter 9. It says, let let not the wise person boast of their wisdom, let not the strong person boast of their strength, let not the rich person boast of their riches, but let them who boast boast about this, that they understand me and they know me, that I am the Lord. So what this is, really quickly here, in about 30 seconds, we're going to pray a prayer together. This is about you coming to know the Lord. Listen, can I encourage you? Knowing about God is not the same as knowing Him. Knowing about Jesus, knowing about the cross, knowing about Christmas, knowing about Easter, that's not the same as actually experiencing it. And so if you want to say, I want to come to know the Lord this morning, and I want to enter into a relationship with Him, and I want to know the joy of having my sins forgiven, what we're going to ask you to do is just simply, here in a minute, with our heads bowed, all of our eyes closed, we're going to ask you to slip up your hand. What you're saying is, Pastor, include me in the prayer. I want to pray this prayer with you. We're not going to ask you to move. We're not going to ask you to speak. We're not going to embarrass you in any way. But many hundreds of people now have done what I'm asking you to do right now. If, you, if your heart's pounding right now, and you say, I know. I, you don't need a pastor to tell you. You know in your heart because God is faithful that you're not in right relationship with him. But if you'd like to turn that around today and start again, he's willing to help you. He'll save you. So if you want me to pray, if you want to pray with me, this prayer that we're all going to pray, just simply slip up your hand right now. If you've never done this, if you've never received Christ, you slip your hand up right where you're at. We'll see that hand. 
And we'll include you in this prayer. Anybody at all? Anybody at all? We have a group of people. If you raise your hand, just keep your hand raised until we bring you a bag. There's a bag with some resources in it to help you continue in your walk with God. I don't want to miss anybody. We're not going to drag this out, but I want to leave anybody out. If you're saying, I don't know, man, I don't know, I'm scared. Listen, a lot of people have made this choice. You can too. Anybody say, I want to be saved today. I want to be forgiven. Born again. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. All right. There's some resources in that bag. They'll tell you about them. The person standing next to you with that bag is going to pray with you as I pray. There's a card in there. We want you to fill it out. There's a CD in there as well. Listen to that CD today, please, sometime today. Some helpful encouragement on there to help you begin strong. We're all going to pray this together, okay, to help our friends who are courageously stepping out and saying, Lord, I want to belong to you. I want to follow you. I want to be a disciple. Amen. So let's pray this all together to help our, these are coming into the family of God. Dear God, I call upon your name and I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for living for myself, but I want to live for you. I'm calling on your name and I'm asking you to save me. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose again. And I believe you're alive now. I turn away from my past. And I turn to you. So help me to live for you. Help me to follow you. And to obey you. All of my life. I pray this in faith. In the name of Jesus my Savior. Amen, amen, amen. And just like that, we welcome new people in the family of God. Keep praying for these folks. Keep praying that they'll grow strong in the Lord and they'll make a difference for Him. Amen, amen. They're going to sing us out. Let's raise a hallelujah. Is that what we're going to do? We're going to raise a hallelujah. Hey, encourage three or four or five people before you go, okay? Happy Thanksgiving. God bless you, man.